Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's episode, host Lee Lazarson talks with Reverend Robert Stearns from Eagle's Wings Ministries, and Jack Grunspan tells us about the latest developments from B'nai Zion. We'll be right back after these messages. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're at the wonderful Desert Museum in beautiful Miami, and uh, surrounding us is millions of dollars worth of amazing cars. So uh, we urge everyone to come and visit this museum. We're here with Pastor Robert Stearns. Uh, Pastor, you're a founder and executive director of Eagle's Wings Ministries. That's right. And uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, Eagle's Wings Ministries. Well, it's great to be with you tonight, Lee, and I appreciate JLTV and all the great work that the network does. Uh, Eagle's Wings is a broad coalition of Christians and churches and ministries really around the world, and we're involved in a lot of uh, projects around the world, but one of the core values that we have uh, is support for uh, the Jewish state of Israel. And uh, so a lot of what we do surrounds um, teaching and educating the Christian church about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith and then promoting activism on behalf of Israel here in America and all around the world. Why is it so important for you to support Israel, for Christian organizations uh, like Eagle's Wings to support Israel? You know, I really believe there's three primary reasons that are motivational uh, in our support for Israel. Um, First and foremost, uh, the whole context of our faith uh, came from the Jewish people. Uh, Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, King David, uh, Queen Esther, all of these. These are the heroes uh, for us as well. And so our Bible, our scriptures, even Jesus, uh, the most famous Jew uh, who unites and separates us, uh, uh, came from the Jewish people. And so, um, number one, we have a debt of gratitude to the Jewish people because the foundation of our faith has come from the Jewish people. Number two, um, horrific atrocities have been done throughout history against the Jewish people in the name of Jesus, in the name of Christianity. We would argue that these things were never the true intent or message of Jesus or the early church. Nevertheless, these things have happened throughout church history. And so we feel from the place of teshuvah, from the place of repentance, um, that it's our responsibility to work to right the wrongs of the past and to stand in solidarity with the Jewish people. And thirdly, Uh, Sadly, I believe that people of goodwill from all backgrounds today face a common enemy uh, in terms of forces of intolerance and extremism around our world that threaten our future. And so those of us with a shared belief in basic human rights uh, that Israel so powerfully embodies there in the Middle East, we need to unite together uh, and stand together for the future of our planet. Um, I have a very close friend who's uh, very uh, Baptist and uh, in his beliefs. He's not just Baptist, he's, he's very, very Baptist. very Baptist. Okay. Um, and we have, a, we have a wonderful relationship and we talk uh, religion on an ongoing basis. And, uh, and there's, that, there's that part of Christianity that, uh, for lack of a better terminology, needs Israel to survive because it's part of the, uh, the belief and the long-term goal of the uh, rapture and the second coming of Christ, uh, and I'm and I'm not the the person to speak with, uh, you know, to speak to that exactly. So explain that to our audience. Uh, on, on one foot, just real quick, <laughs> explain Christian theology please, to please, our audience. Okay. Please. Well, first of all, uh, let's understand this. There are many Christians, many organizations, definitely myself and our organization included who do not support Israel out of some apocalyptic vision or end times scenario. Right, that, is, that is the criticism. You're right, and that is, that is absolutely not part of our, uh, of our modus operandi or our motivation. Secondarily, I would offer that the vast majority of the prophecies and the scriptures that kind of give rise to this kind of discussion are not really Christian prophecies. They're Messianic prophecies found in the Jewish texts Mm -hmm. and from the Jewish prophets. And so it's really a question of um, a Messianic mindset um, and how people interpret that. Um, So, you know, my comment is, Uh, That's part of why organizations like Eagle's Wings are so important, uh, because our goal is to broaden the understanding of the Christian church, uh, to help the Christian church understand 
um, that we're not just worried about what's going to happen in Israel someday off there in the future. We want to be concerned about what's happening right now today. Mm -hmm. And by the way, not only for Israel, but for the safety of Jewish people in nations around the world. We're very concerned about what's happening in Europe, for example. Um, you know, we've seen an incredible rise of anti-Semitism just one generation after the Shoah. So prophetic scriptures are interesting, and as people of faith, we should study them. Uh, they are interesting to us, uh, but I think we need to be very focused on the here and now and motivated by what is right in front of us today. Very good. What are some of the um, tools that your organization uses to uh, promote the awareness of Judaism? Well, um, Again, I don't know if it would be promoting the awareness of Judaism as much as promoting the understanding of the centrality of Israel today mm -hmm. uh, and how that connects. We have four primary programs. Um, the first Sunday of every October, we have a, a day called the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem. Uh, Shalom Shalom Yerushalayim, uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122. And um, we launched this about 10 years ago in cooperation with Dr. Jack Hayford in Los Angeles. And today we have close to 400,000 churches in 174 nations, about 95 million people who participate every year. Um, we have another program called Shomrei Chumot, Watchmen on the Wall, which is a training program. We want to bring Christians to Israel as tourists and bring them back as Zionists. Mm -hmm. um, so I've brought over 10,000 Christians to Israel over the years uh, and we train them, we equip them, we motivate them, and then we bring them back as uh, advocates on behalf of Israel. The third program we have reaches out to a Christian university and college students because I believe that the university is oftentimes the front lines of ideological challenge and battle. And so we bring Christian young people to Israel on a Christian birthright program. Uh, we bring them there for almost a month of intensive training, advocacy training on behalf of Israel. And then fourth, uh, we have two feeding centers in Israel uh, where we're feeding about 500 families a week, uh, one in Tiberias and one in Yerushalayim. And so these are the four primary outreaches that we have on behalf of Israel. Very good. We're going to take a quick break right, uh, right now, but when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, politics and how politics factors into Israel. Well, that should be fun. <laughs> okay. We'll be right back. We're back with Pastor Robert Stearns of Eagles Wings Ministries. Uh, Pastor, before the break, we uh, teased with the discussion of politics as it relates to Israel. And certainly, um, how does the Christian movement mm -hmm. and as it relates to Israel, and how does politics play a role in all that? Now, Lee, here we are, and you're discussing religion and politics with right. me. That, that's, we're we're, we're going to be friends after that's this. That's all right. <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, I, I think that we live in... Uh, a really shrinking planet. Uh, you know, we live in a day and age where our world is interconnected as never before. And so the concept of foreign policy as it relates to, um, you know, local policy has never become more uh, immediate and more felt. And so because of that, I think people are starting to understand more and more that the issues that Israel faces are really the issues that our world faces. What do we believe uh, about uh, the rights of minorities? What do we believe about women's rights? What do we believe about the freedom of religion? What do we believe about the democratic process? All of these issues really uh, embody what Israel stands for in the Middle East. So I'm thrilled that up till now we still maintain a really strong bipartisan support for Israel here in this nation, but I'm concerned to see that continue. Um, and for me, I just absolutely believe that education is vital in this issue. People have to get to the land. They have to see what Israel faces, this tiny, tiny sliver, sliver of land, smaller than the size of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. They need to see that and experience that for themselves. And then whatever their particular... Uh, um, uh, political party or political agenda uh, here at home, hopefully we can understand that the questions of Israel far transcend um, other things that might divide us. Certainly President Obama has taken a lot of criticism for his policy or at least his perceived policy uh, towards Israel. 
Do you have an opinion? Does Eagles Wings or yourself have an opinion with respect to he has moved away from Israel in terms of his support or towards his support, their support? Well, listen, uh, you know, we, we believe as Christians that we need to pray for our leaders. We believe it's an awesome responsibility to be in government, to lead a nation. And so we always want to honor our leaders and pray for God's wisdom for them. I understand that it's a enormous burden that they carry, and, and I could never understand all of the depth of that. Having said that, we certainly have some strong reservations um, about uh, actions that have been taken by this administration, really almost since its very inception, uh, leading up to the recent incidents uh, in terms of nuclear possibilities for Iran. Um, this is not an Israel issue. This is an issue for our planet. Um, and so we, we do have reservations and concerns about the present course of this administration. And again, our hope and our prayer and our work is that um, uh, well-meaning people across political and social divides can unite together uh, on this transcendent issue, which is the strength of the Jewish state of Israel. How about uh, in terms of uh, politics within Israel and the Middle East? Is there support from your organization towards a two-state solution, or do you consider something different? Well, listen, you know, uh, I think the people who live in Israel on the ground have to bear the weight of that decision. It's easy for me to be here an ocean away and give commentary on that, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the folks who live there every day who have to live with the decisions of that and, and move with the decisions of that. Uh, one thing I will say that we do believe very strongly, uh, you know, there are well over a million uh, Arab Israelis who live within the state of Israel with full citizenship. There are Arab members in Parliament and the Knesset, there's an Arab on the Supreme Court. Um, and so when we discuss uh, a potential uh, creation of a Palestinian state, uh, you know, I, I would morally have a problem with a world that demands that that proposed new state would be Judenrein and that the settlers would have to be uh, removed. Uh, why is this the case? Why can there be over a million Arabs living within the Jewish state of Israel and it not be possible uh, for Jewish people to live in peace and security within areas where they live in a proposed Palestinian state? So these are issues, again, uh, that go to the kind of world we're going to have. Are we going to allow racism uh, to rule our planet? Are we going to allow this kind of um, ethnic division to, to rule our planet? Or are we as the human family going to say that every race, every ethnicity is created in the image of God uh, and, and is worthy of dignity and respect. Um, that, re that reciprocity has to go among all members of the human family. Um, and so I'll let the Israelis deal with the day-by-day -day decisions of their government and those policies, but I don't think that there should be anywhere uh, where Jewish people are not welcome. Your organization brings thousands upon thousands of people uh, over to Israel on a yearly basis. Um, so there's your, your opinion with respect to Jerusalem, whether Jerusalem can and should be divided, would be an important one for your ministry in terms of how you bring people over and who's responsible for um, the historic religious sites that are there. Listen, show me a time in human history where, where dividing a city has ever been the real, uh, the real answer to things, right? Uh, wasn't that Berlin? We wanted to tear down the wall. Um, again, uh, you know, we can have, uh, under Israel's leadership, uh, all three religions have been able to have full access to the holy places. Um, all three religions have been able to, uh, you know, fully express themselves in that city. There's been incredible infrastructure improvement in that city on all areas of that city. Um, and so it would be an extraordinary loss to societal advancement as the human family if Yerushalayim, the city of peace, was not able to be a united city uh, that lived in some level of peace and harmony. I'm going to ask you a much easier question right now. Um, do you believe that Islam is a religion of peace? <laughs> You're throwing me the easy question. And I think I have 60 seconds to right. answer this one, right? you got about a minute to go, correct. Um, I think that there are enormous textual problems within the Quran, um, uh, and there are enormous historic problems within uh, Islam as regards peace. Um, but I think any people group uh, can make a commitment uh, to renaissance and to 
uh, a re-understanding and a recontextualization uh, of their faith. And I salute people like uh, Judy Jasser, uh, a Muslim leader in Arizona, like uh, Irshad Manji in New York City, and other Muslim leaders who are really calling for reform um, within Islam. And I pray that folks of good well, goodwill within the Islamic faith um, succeed in making an impact. Pastor Stearns, where can our audience uh, find more information on Eagle's Wings? Yeah, uh, www.eagleswings.to. It's an unusual website, but www.eagleswings.to. We invite folks to drop by. Very good. Pastor Stearns, thank you very much for joining us tonight thank on Lachayim. Great to be here. Thank you. We're in the amazing Bond Room at the Desert Museum in beautiful Miami, and we're here with uh, Jack Grunspan, who is uh, Executive Vice President of the B'nai Zion um, organization. And, and Jack, we're at the Desert Museum for a wonderful event this evening. Uh, tell us about it. Um, this is B'nai Zion's second annual gala. Uh, we're raising funds for the B'nai Zion Medical Center, which is located in Haifa, Israel. Uh, the location is great. It's on the Mount Carmel. Unfortunately, it, um, it faces north. So from the north side of the hospital, you can see Syria and you can see Lebanon. But the problem is that they can see you. So in order to avoid the possible tragedy that could have happened during the second Lebanon war, the hospital decided to go ahead and build an underground protected emergency department on the south side of the hospital. So for the past year, year and a half, that's been the main um, project of the organization in order to get that done before the next war and unfortunately it's not a question of in of if it's just a question of when this is going to take place. Tell us about the the particulars of the it's an emergency um, room an emergency it, department. It'll be an emergency department um, it will be two floors on the ground. The emergency department itself will be two floors able to house a hundred patients. It'll be protected biologically nuclear and chemical um, from weapons of that sort, and it will be used on a regular basis. It's not something that's going to be waiting for a war, but they will move the current emergency department down to the underground one, and it will be used all year long for emergency patients. And when it comes to during a war, it will be able to treat the casualties of war. Is this one of the only hospitals of its kind in the world? Um, no, actually a lot of the hospitals in Israel now um, are building underground emergency departments. The Rambam Hospital, which is also in Haifa, has a, is um, completing their underground de um, emergency department. S other hospitals that are being built currently have it in their plans to build underground emergency departments, but 40, 50, 60 years ago nobody ever figured that they would have that type of a need, so they weren't prepared for it. And how many people can be served with this, uh, these underground floors? In, in the underground emergency department, they'll be able to take care of 100 patients. The hospital itself is a 450-bed hospital. Um, it's unique in that it has certain departments that are exclusive to the B'nai Zion Hospital in northern Israel. Um, for example, the Rambam Hospital is the only one that has a heliport. So during the last Lebanon war, when there were wounded soldiers in Lebanon, they airlifted them to the Rambam Hospital. And after they were treated, they shipped them to B'nai Zion Hospital because B'nai Zion is the only one with a rehabilitation department. So each hospital has its own specialties. So we have a lot of specialists in a lot of departments related to children, autistic children, blind children, etc. Very good. And you're honoring a, a number of individuals tonight. Um, who are some of your honorees? Correct. We're honoring Mr. Mike Abrams, uh, Pastor Mario uh, Brank Brankman, um, Bramnick. Bramnick, sorry, um, and um, Bill Hansen, and Dr. Robert Stearns. Um, in in um, you're honoring them for. Tell us about what they're being we're, honored. We're for. honoring them for their commitment to Israel. Okay. While some of them are not Jewish. Um, I want to say that the Christians have been tremendous friends to the Jewish people and to be in supporting Israel. So what B'nai Zion has done is one of the, I want to say, leading organizations in this area. Uh, we've gone into the Christian community who have been tremendous supporters of ours in order to make sure that the work gets done at the proper time. And all these honorees have proven themselves time and again how much they love Israel and how much they feel that America and Israel are partners. How much... Uh, I mean, what's the dollar amount that you need, that the hospital needs to build this kind of uh, facility? Okay. The cost of the underground department is, four, is $8 million. The government says if we raise four, they'll match the four. Okay? The chairman of our board came up with a $2 million matching gift. So basically we need to raise $2 million 
the chairman of our board will match the two. The four goes to Israel. The hospital now can start building because the government will match the four. Well, from some of the people that I've seen here tonight, they have that in their pockets. Um, hopefully they won't when they go home. <laughs> right, very good. We're going to take that. I tell, don't, don't give till it hurts, give till it feels good. And so, tell us about the good works that um, uh, B'nai Zion has done uh, in addition to this emergency well, wing. The organization is 105 years old. Uh, we've done a number of different projects. We support a home for abused children, a college, a library, a music conservatory, places around the country. Um, one of the unique things about B'nai Zion, I mentioned our chairman before, his name is George Schaefer. He set up an endowment for B'nai Zion in the amount of $30 million so that the income from the endowment covers all of the operating costs of running the operation. So any gifts that are made for any of the projects, 100% of it goes to the project because the administrative costs are covered. Very good. through the endowment. And how often uh, do you do fundraisers in other cities around the country? Yes, we have an office in Dallas, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and the main office is in New York and South Florida. So we do fundraisers for a number of the different projects around the country. Um, and it's something that we just, hopefully the need will go away one day, but it doesn't look like it'll go away in the near future. Right. We're coming out of it now, but what have the last few years been like in terms of raising funds for B'nai Zion, in terms of what the economy and how that's impacted um, on your fundraising? There's no question that it took an effect. There's no question that Bernie Madoff um, took, an, it took an effect. And people ask me, well, if Israel's a developed country, why do you need to raise money for it? And my answer is that all of B'nai Zion's projects are projects that you would give to if it was in the United States. People donate to hospitals, they donate to libraries, they donate to music conservatories. Well, these are the projects that we um, take care of because it's a need that falls into an unknown niche and it's funds that are raised beyond what the government supplies. Um, for example, in the home for mentally uh, for um, abused children, the government supplies the place with X number of dollars per child, but not for sneakers or sports equipment or music equipment or computers in their apartments and things of this nature is where we try to fill in so that the child should have a more normal life. Do you work in support of other Jewish organizations as well? Um, no. No, um, we, we're independent, we're not part of Federation, mm -hmm. but all of our projects are charitable projects in Israel. So that the Home for Abused uh, Children, for example, is called Mossad Hava. They're a nonprofit in Israel. The hospital is a nonprofit in Israel. So we're basically doing work for nonprofits in Israel by helping them do fundraise outside of the country. And very good. Tell us how our audience can get in touch with you. Um, we have a website, www.benezion.org. Um, it's a wonderful organization. I can tell you I've personally been involved for 40 years. Um, one of our original members um, was, um, forgive me, I can't remember his name, but it's 105 years ago. He's not around anymore. Um, and it's just the one I, I committed for 25 years. My wife and I were volunteers before I came to work for them. So for 25 years, we felt this was the right cause. And then 16 years ago, they asked me to come on board. And now I'm happy to say that I run the operation and and it's the right course to give. There are plenty out there, and this is one of them. Very good. Give us your so, website again, please. Uh, B'nezion.org. B-N-A-I-Z-I-O-N.org. Very good. Jack, thank you very much thank for inviting you. us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this edition. For more information on our show, please visit us on the web at tolifelechaim.com. I'm Lee Lazarson. Thank you very much for joining us. And to life, l'chaim. <laughs>